This is Captain Doug Springer. Captain Springer is the former Cape Fear River Keeper and was the active keeper in 2008 when the announcement was made that Titan was coming to the Cape Fear. The River Keeper is part of a global network of citizens who fight every day to keep waterways safe from devastating pollution. They are all members of a global coalition called the Waterkeeper Alliance. As an ambassador from the Alliance and Cape Fear community, Captain Springer reached out to Titan. He asked if they would be respectful neighbors or if they would put their profit before the community. My first reaction was that I uh, actually sat down on my computer and sent them an email and uh, welcomed them and asked for a meeting so that I could learn more about what their intent was and about their business because I really knew nothing about it, just like most of the citizens in New Hanover County. Uh, so my first uh, inclination was to reach out to them. I thought I'd be a good ambassador to be the first one to meet them. I met um, you know, their uh, PR person for breakfast, and um, you know, when she told me that it really wasn't my concern as to you know, why they were coming here and that they did not pollute, um, I walked away from that meeting and let her know that she probably should report back to her higher-ups that this meeting did not go very well. She may have thought it went well, but it did not go well. After hearing about Titan Cement and meeting with them and understanding their true intentions, I basically said, this will happen only over my dead body. We basically asked them to take a recess. You know, just wait for, take a 15 minute recess and stop and talk about this. Um, Titan Cement stood up, threatened all the commissioners that if they didn't want them here, they were gonna leave. Commissioners promptly sat back down and, and gave them the $4 million. It was very evident that uh, we didn't have the leadership that we needed. The people in that room, um, the 15 of us or how many there were, we all, you know, we were in shock. And we said we had to do something about this. And that's really the seed that the coalition grew out of. It was the people in that very first meeting. It was a cross-mixed group of people. And we've become friends and we all had different interests from protecting the river to protecting our children and really just trying to change the way our government is run. We have the opportunity to do something brand new here. So in that way, we could thank Titan Cement for coming in, trying to do it the old way, bully their way in, and force something down the, the necks of the citizens of New Hanover County. Well, thank God there were people that weren't willing to allow that to happen, and it wasn't our county commissioners. They were more than willing to allow that to happen. It was the new citizens, the new entrepreneurs, the new mom and dads that had moved to this community that stood up and started this fight and have continued this fight. These nonprofits um, have limited resource. I mean, and companies such as Titan Cement know that. So before we were to go to battle, we first had to get our own in individual organizations behind us. But then it was really pulling together, you know, pulling together the, the community at large, laying a framework that when we look back on this fight, that we could be proud as to how we want it. The Stop Titan Action Network, or STAN, is a coalition of seven organizations. North Carolina Coastal Federation, Cape Fear River Watch, Pender Watch and Conservancy, Citizens Against Titan, the North Carolina chapter of the Sierra Club, the Southern Environmental Law Center, and Duke University Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, and Duke University Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, and Duke University Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. I'm not an environmentalist, I'm just a physician. And I came to learn about this pretty late. I was appalled. There's more than 8,000 children who could be very close to that factory. Who want answers, who want their elected officials to represent them and to look out for public welfare and not for political or financial gain. They didn't consult with the community. They were gonna take that bold step forward and make a hundred year decision for all of us without any of our input. That's the problem that we've got here. It's not just about mercury, it's not just about the destruction of thousands of acres of 
wetlands, it's not just about the contamination of our water and our aquifers. It's about choice. And I think if you continue to stand up like this and let them know that they cannot be allowed to do that, then you will be given those choices. You know, I got involved in uh, the effort to stop Titan because one of the other pediatricians, a friend of mine and colleague, Dr. Eddie Herger, Eddie stopped me in the nursery and said, hey, did you hear about the cement plant thing? I was like, oh, no, I have no idea. What's the deal? Eddie was really up in arms about the impact of mercury on the environment and on children. After talking to him, I figured I'd better educate myself. We know that it's a very dangerous chemical. Uh, when kids are exposed to it, especially in the wrong forms. And the thing that got to me, uh, as somebody who's had asthma myself, been hospitalized for asthma in childhood, who has two children who also suffer from asthma, was nobody was talking about the air. Nobody was talking about these pollutants which cause asthma in the most athletic children and worsen asthma. I've been in the ER, unable to breathe. I know what that feels like. And every day I take care of kids and have children of my own who knows what that feels like. I wouldn't call myself necessarily an environmentalist. I care about the environment, but what I care about most is children's health. And that's what I speak up about whenever I see anything that I think threatens children's health. It's my turn to stand up and speak for the kids because they can't speak for themselves. It's part of my job. I was stunned. I mean, it's like being in, in one of those really bad plays where nothing makes sense. You're like, dude, I, you know, I just said black is black and white is white, and, and you're coming after me for that. Well, I don't get it. It's absolutely stunning. I still don't get it. You know? Well, this is a billion dollar company. Um, obviously, they have a lot of money. and. Um, they have good lawyers, I'm sure. Having um, this suit brought against me, <clears throat> basically trying to stifle my First Amendment rights, just makes me want to speak louder. Brinkley Hutchings is a community organizer with a non-governmental organization known as Green Corps. Green Corps promotes environmental and human rights around the world. As president of the University of North Carolina at Wilmington's Environmental Concerns Organization, Brinkley joined Kane in the coalition in the fight against Titan. She spent her childhood zipping up and down the streams and waterways of coastal Alabama in a little outboard skiff entrusted to her by her father. Brinkley has inherited a deep respect for the importance of water. Water is a big issue. Titan has said they would use 8 to 16 million gallons of water a day for their mining practices, meaning they would drain that much water from the drinking water aquifer every day. So there's a concern over water contamination. There's a concern over access to water. New Hanover County uses about 13 million gallons of water a day. So Titan would be using close to or more than the amount of water our entire county already uses on a daily basis. That is not acceptable, especially when we're facing droughts and water shortages. There already has been in other areas of the state restrictions on personal water use, but as far as industry goes, there's no restriction on the amount of water Titan could use, and that's a problem. When we started looking into the Titan case, 
there were lots of different moving parts, and you realize this is a huge operation, right? It's going to be the fourth largest cement kiln um, in the country, largest in the southeast region. There are lots of different components of the facility that are, gonna, are going to require a variety of environmental permits. Because there are going to be some federal permits involved, we knew that that was going to trigger an environmental review under the National Environmental Policy Act. A lot of companies seem to get scared of NEPA, you know, doing this comprehensive analysis. I'm not quite sure why, because NEPA doesn't say you can't build. It doesn't matter how bad the impacts are going to be. All you have to do is analyze them, disclose them to the public, allow the public an, uh, an opportunity to comment on that, identify other resources of concern, respond to those comments, and boom, you're done. You have to identify the different types of permits that would be required. But NEPA doesn't have any kind of substantive threshold beyond which the company is told that they can't go forward. All it is is public disclosure. But for some reason, they seem to be very afraid of releasing that type of information to the public. The more we started looking into this, uh, looking at uh, some of the impacts that other communities had experienced, uh, you know, it became more and more of a concern. And then when we started pulling information about Titan's record of compliance and other places where it does business, that gave even more cause for concern. I started to pull information about uh, cement kiln dust disposal. And uh, you start looking at the porous aquifer in this area, the amount of groundwater that would be pulled, um, the kind of loose <laughs> regulations uh, that go into cement kiln dust disposal. And I felt like the community really had cause uh, to be alarmed. From my experience, if a company shows concern and fear, about releasing that type of information to the public, that means you need to scrutinize the process even more closely because there's going to be something that is potentially very damaging. Why don't they want the public to know? <laughs> because it would get the end up being very controversial. Uh, my name is Craig Galbraith. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship and technology management in the Department of Management, Cameron School of Business at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Uh, from an academic point of view, I've been a professor at uh, University of California, obviously here at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, uh, in Europe at uh, several Scottish universities, uh, again, specializing in, again, entrepreneurship and particularly economic development as it relates to high technology uh, relocation and location and expansions, expansion of businesses. As soon as I heard that there was an economic impact study being presented, uh, that's what really interested me. I didn't know anything about Titan or the cement industry. And so after I heard that there was an economic impact study being presented to the uh, County Board of Commissioners, uh, I went down there and challenged it. So my uh, initial interest was to say, well, before you make any decisions, uh, this should be really investigated. It doesn't pass the sniff test in terms of what's being presented. Um, later on, I found that there's an actual group uh, getting involved in terms of anti-Titan. They've contacted me. I've been contacted by a number of people, but I'm not part of the anti-Titan uh, process. I'm uh, an academic that studies economic impact, and uh, my primary interest is to make sure that economic impact studies are properly done. I have a copy of the original Titan study, and the whole study is a one half page effort. Uh, it was done by the day before the approval process of this Now, the most critical concern, however, third, the Titan analysis is what is called dispersal forces. Dispersal forces are those forces that actually, over the long run, reduce economic activity. With a large new heavy industrial facility, these include congesting existing infrastructures, perception that an area is favoring a certain type of economic activity, such as heavy industry, and that will discourage tourism, <coughs> retirement investment, and clean industry and then the disastrous economic impact of pollution and environmental damage. The actual long-term economic effect of these plant locations has been extensively studied. The conclusions of these studies are that, on the average, locations of heavy industry may actually decrease employment and long-term economic activity. In one important public study of over 100 plants in Georgia, the research found that each 100 new employees hired by the relocating firm after five years resulted in net gain of only this would suggest that the 160 proposed employees of Titan Cement would result in a net gain of only 46 employees, not the 720 suggested by Titan. 
This means that the original analysis of the prices of their overestimates the cost of employment in that by about 15 times. In terms of understanding the sustainable aspects of um, uh, cement manufacturing, that really is more of a legal requirement. We need to establish the laws to protect society. We need to protect, you know, we do need to establish environmental regulatory uh, responsibilities uh, to protect society, to minimize pollution these days and so forth. The question is, can you develop a clean uh, type of industry of high technology and service, which, by the way, have a much greater multiplier effect? There's not a lot of negatives to those type of industries. Can you have that sort of economic development at the same time we're promoting heavy industry and possibly polluting industry next door? So I can't give a definitive quantitative number to that, but what we can do is raise the issue that if that incompatibility is there, then possibly we're even going to have a negative impact. When people hear economic impact, they hear jobs, not understanding the complexities that I talked about later with real economic impact, there's a knee-jerk reaction that, well, let's go ahead and do it without really thinking about the long-term strategic plan about what we want to be. The Titan started to push back um, with some of the public concerns. Uh, Titan had commissioned a report by a company called Intertox. Uh, to look at what the uh, community scale impacts might be with a particular focus on mercury. And their conclusions that, well, people who, you know, rely on fish harvested from the river, yeah, they're going to have more contamination. You know, they're going to ingest more mercury and, you know, they can just eat different fish. It really showed a disdain for uh, the community and for um, subsistence level fishing and for the, the real heartfelt concerns that people had in that area. I just thought it was pretty dismissive and disrespectful of the community itself. That's when things started getting complicated. What's happening at the regulatory level that we're not being informed of, you know, we being the public, the public's not being informed of, and why is there so much difficulty in getting information? The company didn't want to do this environmental review. They didn't want to disclose the level of environmental impacts associated with this facility until they had gotten a ground hold. That seems to have been the strategy. You know, try to get that tow hold, get that clean air permit, um, which is essentially just a permit to pollute. You know, it gives you permission to emit a certain amount of pollution into the environment. Let's go ahead and get that permit, and then we'll answer these broader questions later. So NEPA wasn't the only course for doing that, though. There's also a state-level law called the State Environmental Policy Act. It's similar to NEPA, requires that same kind of disclosure of environmental consequences. So why wasn't the state moving forward with that? There was going to be a state action with a significant impact on the environment. Um, there was the promise of public money. All the different triggers were there. You've got $4.5 million in public incentives. That requires SEPA. So we took them to court and we said, no, actually public money is public money. It doesn't matter at what stage in the proceeding the money is offered. The fact that it is a reduction of the public coffers <laughs> constitutes public uh, investment and therefore you know, is the trigger of SEPA. Well, the court agreed with us. And lo and behold, the company says, oh, well, we're, we're turning in those incentives. Yes, it had the, still had the potential for significant environmental impacts, but without that third trigger of... Uh, uh, public expenditures or use of public lands, there was no way to complete the analysis and, and force compliance with SEPA. So here again you have this pattern of really trying to dodge and avoid compliance with a basic disclosure requirement. That's it. Tell us what the impacts are going to be in this community. And still the company refuses to comply with that basic idea and they're willing to go to um, pretty great ends to avoid that. The company succeeded in getting the State Environmental Policy Act amended such that if you did have the public money provided, it still wouldn't trigger the requirement that you do this environmental review. And I don't know that it was Titan that got it changed. 
I do know that a lot of the legislators who expressed concern about this from the get-go were motivated in part by the concerns raised around the Titan facility. And the company has submitted new information, new modeling information, uh, now stating that you know, they will have to come into compliance with new uh, federal level regulations. Um, but at the same time, they've also challenged those federal regulations. So you have, on the one hand, them saying, yes, we're going to comply with these more strict federal requirements. But on the other hand, going after and attacking and saying there's no basis for EPA to be doing this level of regulation. In fact, been in the conversation dialogue with a number of our leading uh, industry folks, not manufacturers there, I don't believe, but it came up several times <laughs> that right now new regulatory burdens upon industry is not good. And I think this bill would, would address that. And it's coming from all segments, not just our manufacturers. I introduced this bill at the request of our major manufacturers in the state, and it is in response to, as I said, the growing frustration that some of our rulemaking boards and commissions uh, bring to bear upon, uh, upon our, our business creators. And what this bill does says, unless there is a very compelling reason, we'll list the reasons, I do not think we should be adding new regulatory cost burden on our state businesses, particularly at this time. So the bill says in order for a rulemaking body uh, to, to adopt a new rule, uh, it, has to, it has to be required by one of five things. A serious and unforeseen threat to the public health, safety, and welfare, and that's pretty comprehensive. An act of the legislature or Congress, a change in the state or federal budget policy, a federal regulation, or a court order. Now, if, any of those, uh, if any of those things are in existence, then an agency can go forward with new rulemaking authority. But uh, if not, then they could. Uh, and if, the rule, if the rule that they were proposing it makes no additional cost burden upon industry or business or job creation, uh, then the rule could go forward. All others must meet one of the tests, the five tests that I just mentioned. That's what the bill does, and I think it would just show good faith that we are trying to, to ease the record, an unnecessary regulatory burden upon our job creation at this time. What the majority wants to do here today is to put a pair of Portland cement shoes on the EPA and then throw them into the river and if the EPA doesn't die uh, from drowning uh, the mercury is going to kill them. If I was a trade association I would be arguing you can't impose uh, uh, any kind of restrictions upon us to protect the children of our country. It's just too expensive. Uh, it's too hard for us to do. The Chinese will take advantage of us protecting children from having uh, mercury put into their brains, into their systems. But you want to know what? That's not a good enough excuse for our country. Our country is supposed to be the leader in ensuring that the public health of our citizens is protected. My good friend from Massachusetts was talking about the, uh, the dangers of the health uh, those are real dangers, but again, given the trace amounts of mercury that are emitted per year are in pounds, it is a very tenuous connection to say that, that the mercury from a cement plant has a direct correlation with some of the um, uh, potential side effects. Most foreign operators, uh, they, they basically are producers, they operate without anything close to the level of environmental standards uh, currently in place in America between 75 and 100 percent of the mercury pollutants in two-thirds of the American continent of the country of America is coming from foreign sources and the only solution those who cannot meet these onerous requirements have to stay in business is to move to foreign countries where they do not regulate air quality then I would argue that we are taking it away from the polluters by, by this amendment by saying wait a minute let's look at this and talk it out that's really what we're trying to do. And so I would argue that I'm trying to save the lives of, of American children because the foreigners are polluting our, our air and 75% of those pollutants are created by foreign companies where the only choice for these people to stay in business is to move there. These are high paying jobs that we're talking about. We can't afford to lose that many more. That industry has become much more uh, efficient over the years. These plants today produce far more the numerous plants would have produced uh, years ago. So I, I just can't emphasize enough that as, as we are 
having this great debate about uh, the nature of the economy and jobs that we would be willfully uh, using regulatory agencies that we know are going to cost thousands of jobs in America, high paying jobs. You know, when is enough enough? Let's come on, let's get real. Everybody here protects, uh, supports protecting the environment. Every American supports protecting the environment. But we also support protecting the jobs of the people that live within that environment. And we don't, some of us don't support arbitrary decisions that are made that are going to create, that are going to lose thousands of jobs that are going to close plants. So, again, there, while there is a consensus in this body to protect the environment, there does not to seem to be, Mr. Chairman, a consensus on protecting the jobs of the American people who are desperate for jobs. And without this amendment, we're going to lose more jobs. Let's have some common sense. Let's protect the environment and protect American jobs. I yield back. The American Medical Association just made a policy statement saying that mercury causes deadly human diseases. And in fact, that policy statement looked at specifically the mercury emissions from cement plants, coal-fired cement plants. So they were looking at over 260 pounds of mercury a year. You're looking at fine particle emissions. Now, you can say you're going to put out more or less, but here's the thing with fine particle emissions. There is no safe limit of fine particle emissions. There's not like a threshold below which fine particles stop causing deadly human diseases. They just cause fewer the less you put out. So where do we get our limits from? The limits are there because we accept that when we engage in industrial development we're going to harm a certain number of people's health. And we feel that there is some equation there where that's okay. I agree. There probably is. But if we're not talking about what the real consequences of fine particle pollutants are when we have this conversation, if we have this conversation pretending that there's some level of fine particle emissions that you can spew in the air next to 8,500 plus school children, well, I think we have to have a conversation. Some of those kids are going to get sick. And it's a reasonable assumption that some of those kids are going to get life-threatening diseases. And if you give life-threatening diseases to enough of them for a long enough period of time, some of them are going to die. Who knows how many? You can debate that. You can debate how long it'll take. But you put pollutants that harm people where there are enough people, some people are going to get harmed. The way this community has become empowered because of this issue, I think will be important not just for when we get rid of Titan, but for the next company that tries to come in and pollute our river and dirty our air. That we realize that it's not what we want for the future of this community anymore. We want, we want to go in a different direction. The old way of thinking was, well, that's just, they bring jobs, that's what we're going to do here. And people said, no, we're not going to let this happen anymore. We deserve to have a say in what we want for our future. This is all of our backyards that we're talking about here. This isn't just my backyard. And I think we have to start changing the way we look at things, that 